Good afternoon and thank you for joining us here on 4 to 5. I'm Stacy Spivey. And I'm Ben Briscoe with Eric Chilton. We are socially distancing here, but this is the show where we still want to connect with you. So we are live on Facebook and YouTube right now. We're going to be messaging and responding to your comments and let us know what you think about the news of the day. So let's go ahead and get started. We begin today with a developing story out of Charlotte. In the last hour, the Carolina Panthers have removed the statue of former owner Jerry Richardson from the Bank of America Stadium. The team tweeting saying they're taking it down for safety reasons as it could be a target for future protests in the future. And you might remember Richardson sold the franchise to David Tepper in 2018 after claims of workplace misconduct, which included the use of racial slurs and sexual harassment. We're going to have more on this story coming up. And Jerry Richardson released a statement through a consulting firm. It reads, quote, Mr. Richardson has made no public comments about the Panthers or the NFL since the sale of the team and doesn't plan to do so now as a private citizen. He has worked to treat all people fairly in his business and personal lives and like many other Americans is troubled by recent events in Minneapolis, Charlotte and around the country. Another turn with the racetrack at Ace Speedway. The owner tells WFMY News 2 he is consulting with an attorney after the governor shut down his business. A post on the Speedway's Facebook page says they are working on a statement about all of this. Now, Governor Cooper says the Speedway has broken his phase two ordinance on several occasions. They did that by allowing more than 25 people to gather at the Speedway. When it comes to enforcement of that order, Alamance County Sheriff's Office says the issue with Ace Speedway is now going to be handled not from them, but by the State Department of Health. The Sheriff's Office response comes after the State Department of Health ordered Ace Speedway to shut down. Governor Roy Cooper's office said the Speedway is an intimate hazard for spreading coronavirus. For the racetrack to reopen, the Speedway has to lay out a plan detailing how it will follow state guidelines for social distancing. That plan then must get department approval from the state health department. This story is still gaining a lot of attention online and we want to know what you think about it. You can go ahead and weigh in right now on our live streams, but here's a look at some of the comments from my Facebook page. James says no. If you can protest for hours shoulder to shoulder, then you can have a race. Gary adds, I think Ace should force its customers to distance and only allow a much smaller crowd in the gates. The government should bring in state police to enforce the guidelines and Tammy shared. I do not agree with his decision at all. He needs to get these businesses open and back to work. He can allow other things then Ace Speedway should be open. So keep weighing right now on our Facebook stream as we continue to talk about it. Uh, this is a hot topic here in the triad with thousands of people weighing in yesterday on our question of the day, Ben, and split down the middle really in that decision. Yeah, what you notice is that there's a whole lot of people on one side or the other, but no one really in the middle here. People have some pretty strong opinions about this one. Yeah, and we definitely want to hear yours, so go ahead and continue to weigh in on our Facebook page. Now let's get to your four to five news roundup. Tennessee lawmakers are making moves to protect children. A new law would increase penalties if parents or guardians do not report their children missing within 48 hours. That law is named in honor of toddler, toddler Evelyn Boswell, who was reported missing in February, even though she had not been seen since December. The bill was on its way to a committee for a vote. This as the stepfather of two missing Idaho children made his first court appearance today. There after authorities found human remains on his property. You're looking at it right there. JJ Hallow and Tylee Ryan have been missing since September. Their mother Lori was arrested in Hawaii for failing to comply with a court order to prove her children were alive. Now authorities say her husband is charged with at least one felony. The remains have not yet been identified, but an autopsy is being conducted. We all hate those robocalls, and now someone is going to have to pay for interrupting your life. A Texas company is facing fines for making 1 billion robocalls. The Federal Communications Commission is proposing a $225 million penalty. That's like a uh, less than a quarter, half a quarter of call. The men the, behind the business, two men claiming to offer health insurance plans from major health insurance companies. At least seven states are also suing for violations of the Telephone Consumers Protection Act. And community leaders in Austin, Texas are outraged by video showing the death of a black man in police custody. And again, this video shows him saying, I can't breathe. 
The video is from March 2, 2019, but it was just released a few days ago. Javier Ambler died as authorities tried to arrest him. Now, police tried to stop him for riding with high beams on. Investigators say he drove off and after a pursuit, police tased him multiple times. A state senator, Royce West, says there's enough information here to have a third party review this video. Well, George Floyd's brother was testifying today in Congress in a hearing on police brutality. CBS News' Skylar Henry reports lawmakers on both sides agree that something needs to change. Balonis Floyd arrived on Capitol Hill to testify about police brutality. His brother was laid to rest in Houston Tuesday after dying under the knee of a police officer. The man who took his life, who suffocated him for eight minutes and 46 seconds, he still called them sir as he begged for his life. Mr. Floyd says he believes former officer Derek Chauvin murdered his brother. I know that he knew him. Everybody knew him. The mayor knew him. Killed my brother just because he didn't like him and it has to be racist. Republicans say it's time for real solutions to police brutality, but say defunding police is not the answer. It is pure insanity to defund the police. And the fact that my Democrat colleagues won't speak out against this crazy policy is just that frightening. That feeling was shared by Angela Underwood Jacobs, whose brother Patrick was a federal officer killed in the line of duty last month. It is a ridiculous solution to proclaim that defunding police departments is a solution to police brutality and discrimination. Lawmakers from both parties are working on police reform bills to set federal guidelines for every police department to meet. It should never be that you can do a chokehold in one city and not in another. There should be basic standards. Houston Police Chief Art Acevedo said police departments have to recognize their shortcomings. We must acknowledge that law enforcement's past contains institutional racism, injustices, and brutality. Republican Senator Tim Scott is working on the GOP police reform proposal. So there's common ground between the House bill, our bill, and the, and the White House bill. White House officials met with Scott Tuesday to discuss his plan. Skyler Henry, CBS News, Capitol Hill. Greensboro police are still searching for the people responsible for vandalizing businesses during protests two weeks ago. Greensboro and Guilford County Crime Stoppers released surveillance video showing a group of four possibly connected to that vandalism. Take a look at this video. You can see a group throws objects at a building on South Elm Street and the next incident also happening in the same night caught on camera. You can see one person run across the street, then come back and start hitting center point apartments located on North Elm Street. If you have any information about any of these people, or anything that happened there, call Crime Stoppers. Protesters tore down a Christopher Columbus statue in Richmond, Virginia last night. About 1,000 people gathered for what started as a peaceful protest in solidarity with indigenous people. Now, rioters threw ropes around the statue and pushed it into a nearby lake. That statue has stood in the park since 1891. Bookstores are seeing a rise in sales for books on racism and criminal justice. Nationwide protests in the name of George Floyd have sparked a wave of education as well. And the Dean of the Liberal Arts at Norfolk State University in Virginia says people are craving knowledge. People are alerted, I think more than ever, to issues that have been simmering in our country since 1619. Store owners say they had race related books on shelves before the death of George Floyd. Now it's hard to keep those books in stock. Forecast wise, temperatures are up there. We see a lot of humidity. That means late day pop up showers and storms. They are out there and will be the case as we head into the night tonight. Look at some of the numbers from today 86 in Greensboro right now. Winston Salem, you have the same reading. 88 in High Point, Burlington, you're up to 89 degrees. That heat and humidity hanging in there until this front can clear us, which will take a while, actually, a day or so. But 71 for the overnight low tonight. That means that's as cool as it gets. And we'll usually hit that in the morning hour, say 6, 7 o'clock in the morning. Uh, evening storms tonight, it will be muggy again. Tomorrow, mostly cloudy with scattered late day storms. Once again, that is an 85% chance of showers. I want to show you what's happening right now with the radar. They are widely scattered across the area. Hit or miss, that's kind of the routine we're in. When we zoom in a little bit, you can see some heavier 
あ。Um, can you hear me now? Well, did the, did the video signal go out? Cause. All right, we should be good now. Hold on. Okay, check, check. One, two, three. One, two, three, four. Hello, hello. Might in. Coronavirus-related hospitalizations hit a record high for the third straight day in North Carolina, and case numbers have jumped significantly. Now, that is in large part because more testing is being done across our state. There were more than 1,000 new coronavirus cases. That brings our state total up to more than 38,000. Now, out of that, 24,000 people have recovered, but not everyone does. 24 people died from the virus yesterday and over 7,000 people are in the hospital right now. And if you would like to get tested for the coronavirus, you can get a free one done in Guilford County. Health officials in Star Med Health care testing at Greater First United Baptist Church in High Point is one of the locations. That church is on Deep River Road. You can go tomorrow and Friday from noon to 6 p.m. and then on Saturday from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. All you need to do is complete a virtual visit with Star Med before you go in and take your test. So the North Carolina Senate has approved yet another bill pushing to reopen bars and gyms under phase two. Now, you may remember this bill would differ from the bill vetoed by Governor Roy Cooper. That happened last week. The update gives the governor the power to close gyms and bars again if needed. But the bill lets gyms and fitness centers reopen and bars treated the same as restaurants. That bill is on its way to the House for a vote. We're almost three weeks into phase two of Governor Roy Cooper's reopening plan. And for the first, third straight day, as been mentioned earlier, coronavirus hospitalizations hit a record high and the number of new cases has jumped significantly. So I asked you on my Facebook page if you think at this rate we'll go into phase three on time. Now keep in mind, Governor Cooper said we'd stay in phase two for about four to six weeks. So here's what some of you are saying. Andrea says don't think it's time to open up our state quite yet. And Unless you want to have deaths on your hands. Jerry shared all businesses need to be restored and let people make their own decisions about going into the public. Denise added yes, time to move on with a lot of exclamation points and Michelle said folks won't stay at home, so I think we'll all deal with the consequences. Of course, you can keep weighing in now and tell us what you think about it on our Facebook stream. A lot of the comments I was surprised said that they don't think it's time to reopen. I, I know a lot of people are anxious and, and ready for things to get back to normal or whatever we say, you know, is our new normal. Um, 
But yeah, most people saying it's just not time yet. Um, I'll start with you, Ben. What do you think about this? Well, I think that there's a lot of opinion on both sides again. We do want to hear what you have to say about this because I also want to know from you, how much do you think politics is going to play a role in this? There's a whole lot of pressure on the governor right now to reopen, and he's saying, well, we've got to look at the data, but I wonder in the back of his head if re-election is in his mind about all this. And that's something that yeah, a lot of people are weighing that, in um, on. Oh, sorry, Eric, go ahead. Oh, it's okay. I was just going to say you would think that that does. I mean, it has to play a role to some degree to, yeah. in his mind. I don't think he's making that decision probably based on politics, but you can't, anybody would think that surely that comes across his mind. I, I think that this is such a divisive topic right now that he's probably well suited to say, we got to go with the data in order to, to make these decisions. Cause that's a, nobody's good. There are going to be people mad and people happy. No but matter you what you can't do argue with case. data. You're right, Eric. Yeah, it's very, true. It's true. It's about the only constant that you have. Yeah. Very good point. And of course, as people are working from home, that's kind of why there's maybe a delay. And sometimes we accidentally talk over each other. But, you know, that's just what happens when you're dealing with everything that we are. But uh, we'll be right back with more of four to the five or four to five right after this. What is up, homie? Check one, two, one, two. Hey, man, I was looking through old videos last night. You remember Tevin Campbell, round and round? That was a Prince written song. I didn't know that until last night. Did not know that. You know, if you're looking for something a little different to do, this is about the most cool thing I've seen in a long time. It's it's an all-female produced film festival. I hadn't even heard about this until recently. They've been going strong in other parts of the country and then here in the last few years. It's called Luna Fest, and it won't be stopped by a little pandemic. Nope, they say this festival is going virtual. Take a look. Bill, thanks for being with us today. Uh, boy, you guys are going to have to kind of shake things up with the film festival and do it different this year. Tell us a little bit about the festival for people that aren't familiar, and then how is it different this year? Luna Fest is a collection of films for, by, and about women. They're all women producers, directors. Uh, most of the actors, many of the actors are, are women. Uh, it's been sponsored by the Luna Bar Company, and Hirsch got hooked up with it about 10 years ago, over a decade ago, and so we started hosting festival here uh, on a regular basis. Usually that involves bringing a bunch of people together and having a big time with popcorn and drinks and, uh, and a big party. Obviously that isn't going to work today. And so we're doing a live stream with the 
uh, with the benefit of being able to do smaller house parties, if you will, Luna parties, we're calling them. And um, we are looking to do probably 30 or 40 or 50 of those scattered throughout the whole city and in other places around the country. So really, it's kind of a, a little parties within one big party is what it amounts to. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah, and we're uh, we're hosting one at my house. We're also going to run a side-by-side -side Zoom chat uh, at the same time so people can make comments back and forth. And following the movies themselves, we will host a, a live Zoom party for about 30 or 45 minutes talking about the films, just as if you were uh, you know, at the end of the day at the theater and having a chance to kind of catch up and talk about the films that you liked or didn't like and what really what really caught your eye as the films rolled through. Well, Bill, it sounds awesome. Best of luck out there. This is a great festival you guys are a part of, and uh, we look forward to it getting better and better. So if you want more information on this, all you have to do is wait just after the four to five. We'll post this on our website, WFMYNews2.com. We'll have a link to their site as well. You should really check this out. It's pretty cool and all from the comfort of your home. We're coming right back. Well, there's a lot of heaviness and hurt today and people are looking for ways that they can help others. One option is through the human race, a 5k and one mile fun run that benefits over 70 triad nonprofit organizations. For 26 years, the race has served the community and they're not letting a pandemic get in the way this year. Step by step. Organizers with the human race have been taking this global pandemic in stride and this year the race will go on virtually. The run company we work with actually created an app for this specifically. Race organizer Jordan Lazinski says runners and walkers will download this app and do the race at their leisure. On June 20th, everyone will take part in the live program on Facebook. If you want to help our community heal and repair and 
and come back together and unite, we can really do that in a virtual way through this event. That means getting all 77 nonprofits that benefit from the race up to speed, including the Greensboro Mayor's Committee for People with Disabilities. Definitely a joy. Um, that, that's it. There's no other words to describe. It's definitely a joy. Kendrick Mays describes the feeling of giving out scholarships to students with disabilities and also helping spread Christmas cheer with Shoppers Day each year in December. It was just that feeling where you're able to give and make other people smile. He says this race makes their efforts possible, especially right now. We just asked, you know, if you have $20 or even a dollar just laying around, every amount um, helps and goes to support. Our nonprofits are really the backbone of helping our community thrive. Um, and they are really, they're serving every population that's, that's in need right now. And now after talking to the organizer, Jordan, she said that participation is down and she said it's probably because of everything that's happening yeah. and people are struggling for money. But she is asking if you have anything, even the smallest amount, just like, you know, Kendrick said, it's going to help them. And this is organizations, nonprofits that are right here in our community that are helping people that are struggling from the coronavirus. I'm so glad to see they're adopting and changing because it is an important event. I do have to say that this reminds me of this Fitbit challenge I did with my sister once and <laughs> she was beating us so well when I called her up and I was like, really, you were not walking that much. She put the thing on the dog. No. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't know if people smart. will be doing that, but I am glad they're raising money, Eric. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's a great story. Um, I will tell you this much, when people say every little bit helps, a lot of people feel guilty. They're like, hey, if I can't give more than five or $10 or what, it doesn't matter. Because you think about it, if everybody gave yeah. a little bit, it would equal a lot. Just yeah, a dollar, so 50 cents will help. That's right, that's all it takes. All right, let's talk about our forecast now as uh, we go to the old weather computer here. We've got some showers. Showers and thunderstorms popping up across the area. We'll go into a tighter view here so you can see a lot of it is in the western half of the viewing area, but Winston-Salem down to Lexington, we're seeing lightning strikes in the middle of all that. Uh, that is some thunderstorm activity that is moving to the east, I'd say east-northeast, at a uh, decent amount of speed there. So Kernersville, you're next in line, High Point, and then Greensboro as that system moves together. You know, the question is always, will they hold together? long enough to to uh, make it into Guilford County. But I would say at this point, we all have to watch this very closely because it is uh, a very tight race. We will be looking at showers and thunderstorms in our forecast for a while until this front can clear us. Again, tomorrow, the same story. We'll see high temperatures uh, approaching 85 degrees tomorrow and more of the same. More of the four to five coming up. Hello, mic check one, two, three. Mic check one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Turning on the light. Hello, mic check one, two, three, four, five. Hello, check, check, check. Word. Hello, ice cold milk and an Oreo cookie. Mic check one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Check, check, check. What we see as normal is going to start to look quite different. That's an understatement.
Welcome to Fortify, the interactive news show where we want to talk with you. I'm Ben Briscoe. And I'm Stacey Spivey, joined with Eric Chilton, who is working from home. Y'all, it is hump day. We have made it halfway through the week. Woo! Claps for What a that. long week it's been, too. It has. And, you know, we're going we're gonna to get through it together. We are, and we're going to get through it together on Facebook and YouTube right now. Join in, leave your comments, and let us know how you feel about the news of the day. Yeah, but let's go ahead and get to some of those news headlines for you. Reports suggest Republicans have tentatively selected Jacksonville, Florida for the Republican National Convention. An RNC spokesperson tells our sister station no final decision has been made, but convention officials are looking at Phoenix, Savannah, Dallas and Jacksonville all this week. So that search for the new location comes after President Donald Trump announced he would be moving the event from Charlotte because Governor Roy Cooper would not agree to host a full convention due to the coronavirus. And back into our local news, Greensboro Public Library started curbside pickup for books on hold today. The library reopened at the beginning of the month and anyone requesting holds can request up to 10 items at a time. Patrons still cannot go inside library buildings, but at the end of the month, the library is starting a grab and go service, allowing customers to go in and pick up their materials. This afternoon, the Carolina Panthers removed the statue of former owner Jerry Richardson from Bank of America Stadium. The team tweeting they're taking it down for safety reasons as it could be a target for protests in the future. Richardson sold the franchise to David Tepper back in 2018 after claims of workplace misconduct, which included the use of racial slurs and sexual harassment. I think at this point we all know what is normal to us is going to look quite different in the next couple of months. We'll see more of this. People wearing masks in public, sitting further apart from others. It seems new to us, but experts say this is exactly what happened during the Spanish influenza of 1918. Life looks different now. There are masks, lines for tests, shuttered businesses, schools, and churches. But rewinding 102 years to 1918 Spanish flu pandemic is almost like looking in a mirror. There are a lot of parallels. Dr. John Carlo was on the Texas Medical Association's COVID-19 task force and says one surprise is how fast the virus spread a century ago without air travel. It was unique to travel maybe more than 10 to 20 miles. Newspapers from DFW reveal some health effects officials saying it was just like the seasonal flu and the best advice was wash hands, avoid crowds and wear a mask. All of a sudden, you know, they start to realize people are dying in mass and they need to do something about it. Few have studied the Spanish flu outbreak more than Dr. Alex Navarro at the University of Michigan Center for the History of Medicine. Closures in 1918 weren't as widespread and only lasted weeks. They faced the second spike of cases in many cities in 1918 because they got back to life as normal too quickly. I agree that things were a lot more similar than you might think uh, from 100 years ago. City of Dallas archivist John Slate says World War I camps were a major part of life in DFW at the time. People in the, in the health department who, who went out into the community and gave public talk. About a half million Americans and 50 million worldwide died. We didn't have nearly the ability to do testing and, and detection of viruses. We didn't even know viruses existed back then. A second COVID-19 wave is expected this fall. Navarro says in 1918, it was deadlier than the first outbreak in some cities. No city was able or no state was able to implement a second round of closure orders that was as sweeping as the first because the political and economic will didn't exist. It just evaporated. Life a century ago looks strangely familiar. It would be a waste to not remember what happened then. The nation as a whole just carried on and it became the forgotten pandemic very quickly. Well, it is a slow process, but we are slowly getting back to normal. Now, AMC made a huge announcement this week. They're saying that they will reopen almost all of their theaters next month in July. So the New York Times says that in three weeks, Hollywood is scheduled to launch movies that have been waiting for their release dates. AMC says that the seats will be sanitized and masks will be required or at least encouraged, but it remains to be seen how people will respond to this. So I asked you on my Facebook page, what would it take to get you to go back into the movie theaters? And here's what you had to say. People all over the place on this one. Rhonda Madden said, 
It would take for COVID-19 to be eradicated completely, she says. Lance Tompkins said not having to take out a loan to buy tickets and pop. You know, that's the case, COVID or not, isn't it? Amanda Gilliam feels confident. She says, quote, I'm ready to go now. Normally when I go, I never have problems sitting away from others. And Nancy Wilkie is standing her ground. She says, nothing. It would take nothing. I don't go. It's too expensive. So there you go. Lots of folks just weighing in on how much movies are, not so much about the, the crisis. I mean, they make so much to, they cost so much to make, right? They've got to pay those big name celebrities and then shoot on locations and all that. I think what I've learned through all of this is that my TV and my couch are pretty comfortable. I like it. <laughs> but there's nothing like going into a theater and having the mm. popcorn. Buy you a Bose the... sound system. You'll be fine. Oh, my goodness. I absolutely go <laughs> love going to the movies. So as soon as I'm able to, I probably will. However, I hope that they have several guidelines in place, mm -hmm. and I, I'm sure that they will. I have to tell you one thing, and I'll say this before I go into weather. There was a movie in the 90s that was about kind of a pandemic type thing. I believe it was called Outbreak. Dustin Hoffman was in it. One of the scenes they showed was like a computer graphics of the germs going through the air ventilation system <laughs> in uh, a movie yeah. theater. Ooh. In a movie theater. Hard to and it freaked that. me out. And yeah, after seeing that, I don't know if I can go back for a while. We'll see. Let's talk about a forecast, and we'll get to, to the uh, forecast tonight. 71 will be our overnight low. We will see these evening storms, which we're seeing right now. And then 85 tomorrow, mostly cloudy, again with late-day scattered showers and thunderstorms. You can see the radar. We're kind of lit up here, aren't we? Lots of yellows and reds, which indicate the stronger sections of storms. Now, Winston-Salem and Lexington seeing a thunderstorm moving through. That is moving east, so Kernersville, you're right on the edge of that. Greensboro High High point next in line as well as all of this continues to push on to the east. Now, if we go out to a wider shot here, you notice that the end is in sight, at least. Once this front clears us, we'll have better news for you, and that'll be heading into the weekend. So heading into Friday, you can see, or Thursday, rather, you can see the front is just trying to clear us by Thursday night. So still some showers and thunderstorms tomorrow. And then as we head into the weekend, it's much drier air that moves in, and we see a better situation. Our long-range forecast, after we get through today, we'll see slightly cooler, but still the low 80s, and a beautiful weekend coming up. We'll take a look at our seven-day in just a few. Well, the coronavirus has put Olympic athletes' dreams on hold. A Winston-Salem swimmer was hoping to make it to her second Olympic Games this summer. Then the Games got pushed back until next July, but postponing the event isn't the biggest obstacle for Kathleen Baker. It's the struggle of training to be the best in the world. WFMY News 2's Amanda Ferguson caught up with her after a few months in quarantine. Amanda? For Olympic athletes like Kathleen Baker, it seems like their lives revolve around training to be the best in the world at their sport. But what do you do when your training facilities are closed down for months and you can't train like you normally do? That's been the big challenge for Kathleen Baker. She's used to swimming in Olympic sized pool, but she hasn't had the access. Now she's from Winston-Salem, but lives in San Diego now. So she's been getting in the ocean, surfing, and she's been in smaller pools, but it's not quite the same. Something that has stayed constant, though, her outlook on the situation. I have had a really positive attitude during this and have really just had a lot of faith that everything is going to turn out how it's supposed to. Right now, um, a lot of the swim coaches in the community are really pushing for like practice times rather than opening up the pools to a community, which would obviously bring in a lot more people than having 10 people doing a practice. and. Those are two really big different things, opening up a pool for the summer versus opening yeah. up a pool for a sport. Um, and so we're just trying to do the best we can to lobby to get access to that. Kathleen says her competitors are swimming in pools in other states, so she hopes to get into a pool by July. But she's been so positive, like she said, so she knows that she'll make it to the Olympics next year if it's meant to be. That positivity, a big sign of being an Olympic athlete. NASCAR's only black driver will drive a Black Lives Matter car into tonight's race at Martinsville Speedway. Wallace says the message is simple. All lives matter once black lives matter. Then it will be clear they all matter. He's already received praise from LeBron James on Twitter for the new paint job. Now Bubba Wallace is also asking the stock car series to ban Confederate flags on its properties. All of this comes after Wallace wore a black t-shirt with the words, I can't breathe at Sunday's race in Atlanta. He says no one should ever feel uncomfortable when they go to a NASCAR race.
on average, each person spends two hours and 24 minutes on social media. But looking at social media is one thing, posting is another. So the question is, how often do you post? And here I'm going to ask you, Ben Briscoe, lots of businesses and people, they say that they post differently when they're at work versus when they're at home. Well, I should hope that most people at work are working and not on social media. <laughs> but one thing I love about our job is we get to be on Facebook right now talking with you at home. That's right. So our business is a little bit different. They want us to be on all the time. But lots of businesses have a social media guideline. And even if they allow you to post, you can be fired if you post too much. Lots of employers have social media policies. And um, so they will allow you to post sometimes. Um, or, you know, play on your phone with minimal use. But if you are posting every day while you're at work, or if the employer suspects that you have low product productivity, and then they see that you're posting on social media, they can actually use that as evidence of your low productivity and use that as reason to terminate your employment. It kind of mm -hmm. sounds like they have you targeted before this and find a reason <laughs> to fire you here. How often does that happen? So the lawyer that I talked to, Nicole, she says it actually happens regularly that people get fired for social media posts. But she says it's not usually for posting too much. It's usually for what mm -hmm. they post, what they say. We're going to take a look at that coming up at 5 o'clock. Now, it's the number one topic we get questions about. Stimulus payments. Yes. Text your questions. 336-379-5775. Where is your stimulus payment? Are you eligible? Is there a second round of stimulus? We talk about it. It starts at 530. attractions in the triad and for that matter in central north carolina of course we're talking about the greensboro science center and they've been shut down for a while they will reopen their doors on monday morning today i spoke with the uh, science center director glenn dobergos about what we can expect when we go in monday Glenn, let's talk about this because, uh, you know, you guys have been shut down for a while. I'm sure it's a time to kind of revamp and then you're kicking it back open again Monday. What can we expect? The same old good stuff or you've got some new tricks for us? 
Well, I mean, it's a, it's a mixed bag, to be honest. Um, we obviously have to open very safely. Um, right now, zoos and aquariums are free to open, but museums are not. So we are gonna open only the aquarium and only the zoo outside. So it'll be a one-way path, social distance, strongly recommending masks. It'll be limited attendance, time tickets, all that. Gradually working our way into what was last year going to be a record year for us, record breaking in every way. Now we've got to figure it out, kind of recoup a little bit and um, move forward. So how does this affect, I was wondering just the other day, how does this affect any of your future plans? Because I know you guys have huge growth plans. Does it slow it down or, or are we still on track? How does that work? It's a combination really. Um, so. The zoo expansion, Revolution Ridge, is still moving forward. You know, that we we're blessed that there's bond dollars there, there's private contributions there. So, and we know that come 2021, we're going to need that revenue, that new excitement regarding uh, something amazing to see. It's our largest project in the history of the Science Center. So that's moving forward. Uh, other projects had to stall just because, you know, we didn't have the money in place, so we don't want to go into debt. Half is happening and half is not. And we just had to prioritize. That's awesome. Well, you guys are always changing and innovating, and I appreciate you taking time out. And uh, hey, we look forward to getting back in there on Monday. Uh, we are so ready to see our friends and families and guests again. So thank you for this opportunity, and uh, hopefully the future is good for everyone in Greensboro. So if you want to get in, now here's something different. Whether you're a member or not, you do have to have reservations. I was told, or at least I read that on their website. So I've linked you to their website. Just look for this story on WFMYNews2.com after the four to five so that you guys can get back in there. It's a great place. They even they have more plans if they can get the money, then they'll continue. But that $1.6 million renovation coming up, that Revolution Ridge is going to be huge. Eric, I was planning on going there when it, the weather got better, you know, this spring and then spring came and went and here we are. And um, so I'm very excited to be able to go and explore it. Ben and I were actually just talking about in the studio, the ropes course, and I'm going to be all it's over It's wonderful. That. It's just a great place. Yeah, I can't wait for it. And I'm so excited that stuff like that is starting to open back up because people are at home right now, bored out of their minds, coming up with all kinds of new ways to keep entertained. This is a new internet game called Spot the Cat. Somewhere in here and all of this, Take a close look there is a cat. Yeah, this is real. This is what it's come to in our world today. One user shared this photo of her bookshelf. She captioned it today in Find the Cat. People responded to the photo saying it gave them a moment of silence as they searched for the cat. Do you see it? Comment in our Facebook or YouTube live stream and tell us where you think it is. It just makes my eyes cross looking at that picture. There's a lot going on. <laughs> so much. I think someone needs an organization, like a Marie Kondo moment in that picture. <laughs> well, I can tell you this. When you look for it, if you find this on Twitter, because our producer Tasha and I were doing this this morning, and we were both obsessed with it. Uh, I found it in about a minute and a half. I was lucky. She said it took her about three or four minutes. but. What you think you need to look for is not what you need to look for. That's mm -hmm. the way I'll Just I'll tell us what color is the cat, away. Eric. Give us a hint. It's what? What color is the cat? Give us a hint. Oh, um, mostly white, and it looks like maybe there's a little black involved okay. there. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to go look after the show. I found it okay. pretty easily. <laughs> well, that's because Did you? you're yeah. an expert at everything. That's why I we guess like having so. you around. <laughs> <laughs> that is a smart answer, Ben Briscoe. Smart answer there. That's why I uh, like let's, you. Let's look at our, <laughs> that'll work. Let's look at the radar and see what's going on. Hey, we've got scattered showers and thunderstorms moving across the area. I'm going to zoom in quickly so you can see this one particular cell is starting to pick up. We're seeing more lightning strikes from Winston-Salem to High Point. That is moving into Kernersville right now. Greensboro in the next ooh, half an hour or so probably uh, based on the speed we're seeing now, if not less. So just get ready in Guilford County. Definitely western Guilford County. You're going to see this in a matter of minutes. Um, there are more out there that are widely scattered. You can see on the wide shot here we have more of this as we head into the night now we'll lose that heating of the day and that'll help us a little bit when it comes to uh, the amount of these that we see overnight but still look for a little unsettled pattern there 60 percent chance of more of these in the afternoon and evening tomorrow with a high of 85 hey we're dry mostly for the weekend we're loving this low 80s sunshine to partly cloudy friday saturday only a 20 to 30 percent chance and still in the low 80s for sunday monday and tuesday
We all want to honor our seniors this year since their graduations have been so greatly affected by the pandemic. So that's why we are doing our senior shout outs where you send in someone to nominate. And here are some of the graduates that we are featuring today. Caroline Snuggs just graduated from West Montgomery High School and will be attending Montgomery County College in the nursing program. Over her high school years, she enjoyed playing for the Concordia Lutheran High School soccer team and also being a part of the ROTC program. We wish Caroline the best. Emily McCoy is a senior at Rockham County High School. She is a member of the National Honor Society Beta Club and is a varsity cheerleader. Emily will be attending North Carolina State University in the fall, majoring in business administration. And Priya Harrison is graduating from Cornerstone Charter Academy. She was active on the school's basketball team and plans on pursuing a degree at UNCG. Her parents said, we will always think of you as our little girl, even as you grow into a beautiful, mm. strong and independent woman. We are incredibly proud of you. Love mom and Jay. Sweet words from her family. If you want to share a senior shout out with us, find this submission on our website. You can submit your photos of your senior, but please not a professional photo. We can only use ones you've taken. Let us know their name and their school. You can also include a personal message about them with your shout out. Stick around. Our two cents is next. 